There are two things in this world that I love. One is connections between fanfiction and traditional publishing, and the other is Stargate SG-1. And today I am very excited to talk about a strange intersection of both of those things. So pretty much every major star franchise, except for Star Search, has tie-in novels. Tie-in novels are generally inspired by an existing property, and they take place within in that universe, but removed from the main story that we see in the primary narrative. These novels have always been blessed by whoever owns the copyright, but it's generally kind of iffy on how canon they are. This is not to be confused with a novelization, which is more of a literary counterpart or adaptation of a film or TV show that describes the actual events as they occurred. Star Trek has tie-in novels. I think I actually heard that William Shatner wrote several Star Trek tie-in novels, which kind of makes it fan fiction, so that's interesting. Star Wars has like a bajillion tie-in novels, although they booted an entire novel universe from the canon when they created the sequel trilogy. And to complete the trifecta, Stargate has tie-in novels. For those of you who are watching this because of the fanfiction publishing elements who may not be familiar with Stargate, I'm primarily talking about Stargate SG-1, which is a sci-fi series that ran for 10 seasons from 1997 to 2007. It uses the premise of the movie Stargate from 1994, uh, but it picks up about a year after the events of the movie, and of course it has a different cast. The show centers around a US military team who is referred to by the code name SG-1, who travel to other planets by use of a device known Known as the Stargate. Uh, for the first approximately eight seasons, kind of, the team is comprised of four people. Colonel Jack O'Neill, he is the leader, and he has a very sardonic sense of humor and a deep love of The Simpsons. He is also played by the incomparable Richard Dean Anderson. Apparently all desserts on base are in grave danger. 23 across, the atomic weight of boron. The answer is 10. Yes. You wrote the word fat. Major Samantha Carter, well, she started out as a captain. The military members of the team all get, like, promoted over the course of the show. But not only is she in the Air Force, but she's also an astrophysicist. So she's essentially the brains of the operation. Let's say these are the unstable plutonium molecules that are poisoning the sun. Okay. There's Dr. Daniel Jackson with a PhD in archaeology, who's also a linguist who speaks 23 languages and probably picks up a couple more over the course of the show. Uh, he's also very smart, and because he wears glasses, we're supposed to believe that this very attractive man is like a huge nerd. You want to find out four eyes, huh? Four eyes? And then there's Teal'c who was a high-ranking soldier for, like, the evil alien bad guys, who betrayed his overlords by saving the Earth members of SG-1 at the beginning of the series, and then after that, he also joined the team. Teal'c has the show's catchphrase. Indeed. 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 You say that a lot. But there's something different about the Stargate novels, and I think the story of how these books came into being is probably the greatest thing I've ever heard. Not to oversell it or anything. Many of this- oh, I forgot to bring up my book! I have one! It's titled Roswell, it's got Thor on the cover, but I bought it because the description has Vala and Jack interacting and they don't interact on the show and I wanted to read it in the book and I forgot to bring the book up here. I got that! Many of the Stargate tie-in novels were written by fanfic authors. The story goes that back in 2003, a woman named Sally Malcolm had taken up the hobby of writing Stargate SG-1 fanfiction and publishing it online. And then one day, when remarking upon the prolific nature of her work, her husband said, Wow! If only there was some way you could make money off of this. 
Considering that Fifty Shades of Grey, the ultimate Twilight fanfiction turned published novel, was not released until 2011, Sally's husband was ahead of his time. So even though Sally was skeptical, she sent a fax to MGM, the studio that owned Stargate at the time, and politely asked them, could I please write Stargate books? And MGM called her the next day to tell her that they were interested. There was some weird legal stuff, like there had been a few Stargate novels particularly tied to the movie that had been published a few years prior, but Penguin owned the license for those. But MGM was able to offer UK publication rights. Sally happened to live in the UK. So she and her husband put together a business plan, submitted to MGM, MGM approved, and they were good to go. But instead of Sally writing the first book, she reached out to another fanfiction author named Sabine Bauer and asked her, hey, would you like to write a Stargate book? Sabine said yes, and the first book, Trial by Fire, was published in 2004. Sally and her husband founded Fandemonium, which was the publishing company that produced these novels. She would go on to write a couple of the books herself, and bring on other fanfiction authors like Karen Miller and John Cannon. A few years later, MGM was able to extend Fandemonium's publishing rights worldwide, and they were able to provide licensing for the Stargate SG-1 spin-off series, Stargate Atlantis, and then later the other spin-off series, Stargate Universe. The process of writing a Stargate tie-in novel seems to start with the author putting together a one-page summary and submitting it to Fandemonium, i.e. Sally, and if she approves, the author puts together a longer synopsis for submission to MGM. Sometimes MGM would request changes, but once they would approve, the author would have to stick to that outline which from a writing perspective is pretty interesting because you have to be absolutely certain that you can have the story unfold in a very specific way. Fandemonium edits and proofreads the draft, and then once it's ready, it's submitted to MGM for approval. The author may be asked to make additional changes at this point if there's something that MGM feels doesn't fit with the established canon, or if there's something that just so happens to contradict a plot point in an episode that hasn't aired yet. But once the copy is approved, it goes back to Fandemonium, who coordinates the layout and legal and printing and distribution. I'm talking about this in the present tense, but it does look like it's been a couple of years since Fandemonium published anything, which does make sense considering how long it's been since anything Stargate related has aired on TV. I actually don't know what the state of Fandemonium is since MGM's acquisition by Amazon. Overall, you could debate whether or not these books are canon. They were approved by MGM, but they weren't terribly connected with the script writing for the show. Sally Malcolm had actually gone on to write several audio stories that were then recorded and performed by the original Stargate SG-1 cast, which I think is pretty neat but it also makes that whole canon thing more confusing. It makes sense to me, actually, like in that film, Brief Encounters of the Third Kind. Close Encounters. That's the one. It gets funnier every time I watch it. It's not a comedy. The multiverse theory of quantum physics posits the existence of parallel universes, an infinite number of ever-growing alternate realities that exist concurrently with our own. The theory holds that anything that can happen will happen. If not in this reality, then in another. Boggles the mind, don't it? When in doubt, we can just say that it is canon in an alternate reality. Now, here is what I see as the dark side of this otherwise delightful story. These women writing the Stargate novels, they were all Sam Jack shippers. Well, not all of them, but the main two Sally Malcolm and Sabine Bauer definitely were. Again, if you're watching this video because you're interested in fanfiction and publishing and don't really know about Stargate, uh, Jack and Sam, short for Samantha, are two of the characters that I mentioned earlier. 
Jack is Sam's commanding officer, so they wouldn't really be able to get together in canon without violating regulations. So they have a real will-they-won't-they they thing over the course of the series, and they're often depicted as a couple in alternate reality storylines. I think it's super awkward. I don't like it. I am not a Sam Jack shipper. Why can't they just be, like, platonic friends and teammates and the whole found family thing? Why do you have to have a woman on the team and be like, is she gonna get together with the male lead? I don't know. I, it, I just find it so uncomfortable. And actually, I don't think that any of the main four members of SG-1 should date each other at all. I feel like most people would want Sam and Jack to get together. Or maybe Jack and Daniel. Or maybe even Sam and Teal'c. I don't want it. Any of it. I would absolutely believe that every single person on that team has slept with each other in every configuration possible because aliens made them do it, but I don't want them romantically holding hands or going on dates with each other. Gross. Well, let me tell you, hunting down these women's original Stargate fanfics was difficult. Like many published authors, they've scrubbed their fanfic origins. Well, let me clarify, they do talk about the fact that they used to write fanfic and that's how they got started. I mean, that's how I know this story. Um, they are 100% not ashamed that they used to write fanfic, which I both respect and appreciate. They shouldn't be ashamed of that even if it was Sam Jack fanfic. But there's no mention of the actual stories. They don't talk about what the plots were. There's no hint to what their usernames might have been. So I had to dig, but I found them. Because I am relentless. I found an old post on a Richard Dean Anderson fan forum where one beautiful soul happened to mention the usernames of three of these writers. Now, I had to make a judgment call here, and I decided that I am going to leave their usernames out of this video, uh, but some of their stories, particularly Sally Malcolm's, are still out there. Just dozens of Sam Jack UST stories. Uh, UST stands for unresolved sexual tension, and I'm not sure if that term is used in fanfic anymore, and I'm also not sure if people, like, pronounced it, if they maybe called it ust or something, but that sounds stupid, so I'm just calling it UST. I will read you some of the story descriptions, though. After the events of Beneath the Surface, how will Carter and O'Neill deal with the change in their relationship? A rescue mission leads to problems for Sam and Jack as they struggle not to cross the line and to maintain their friendship. When Jack gets sick, someone has to look after him. Guess who? It's Christmas, it's snowing, and there's a tree. What else can I say? Jack has a woman in his life, and it's not Sam. Sam has a new man in her life, and it's not Jack. Sabine Bauer's works have mostly disappeared, but I did find an old live journal post recommending one of her fanfics, and they do describe the pairing as Sam Jack, so I consider that confirmation that she was a Sam Jack writer. Live journal. I did actually find Karen Miller's fanfic, and it seems to be a long series from the point of view of Dr. Janet Frazier, so it's not Sam Jack, and it doesn't seem to be romance at all. She may have written other stories, but this was clearly her most popular one. Here's the thing, though. There was a red herring that led me in the wrong direction at the very beginning of my search. Sally Malcolm has published several original novels since writing her Stargate books, and most of the stories are gay male romances. She even listed on her author profiles that, like, this is her thing, this is her jam. So I was sure that she wrote Jack Daniel fan fiction. And that's the direction I was digging in, and nothing was coming up. So imagine my surprise when she turned out to be a Sam Jack shipper. 
I can white balance off of this. The only thing that could have brought me more delight than knowing that the Stargate Publishing Company was founded by a fan fiction writer would have been knowing it was founded by a slash fan fiction writer. Like they just would have added a little extra something, there's a little extra spice, but no. That wasn't the case. I don't know if they still use the term slash in fan fiction or in fandoms, but they would have used it at the time that Stargate SG-1 was airing. Um, the term slash specifically refers to gay male pairings in fan fiction. Uh, the term comes from the fact that when you write out like your pairings names, you would write Jack slash Daniel or Jack slash Teal'c. Although it is weird because when you're writing like the heterosexual pairing, you would still write like Jack slash Sam or Jack slash Janet, but I don't make the rules. But despite my thoughts about relationships uh, between the team and Stargate, uh, what if Sally Malcolm wrote an original novel about like a Navy Admiral who is very gruff and sardonic, who has a combative yet kind of flirty dynamic with their civilian scientist colleague. Could be a man, could be a woman. There's different kinds of scientists. And then one day, they make a discovery of an ancient alien device deep in the Atlantic Ocean. With a ticking clock to save the planet from extraterrestrial invaders, they have to figure out how the device works. But can they figure out their feelings first? I'd read it. Or maybe I should write it instead. Just like barely concealed Stargate AU fan fiction. And then it would get published and I'd be like, yeah, you know, this was originally a fan fiction. And people would be like, fan fiction of what? We're talking Stargate. Jack was lingering by the bar, one eye on the door and the other on the rapidly filling table. In the background, a cheesy Christmas classic tinkled away, crooning about chestnuts and open fires and all the other seasonal bullshit. For the tenth time in twenty minutes, he cursed himself for turning up. Jack O'Neill was not a Christmas kind of guy. Behind him, he heard a roar of laughter from his table of colleagues and knew that the evening was going to be a long one. He scowled down into his beer and flicked another glance at the door. He just didn't understand why. If people wanted to go out and get themselves pissed and laid, they felt the need to wrap tinsel around their necks and call it a Christmas party. It was all so meaningless. He didn't even know why he'd come. It sounds like Jack has depression, which I mean like makes sense, but... The door opened, his head turned and his jaw dropped. Holy smoke! Carter stood in the doorway, peering through the dim light, dressed from head to toe in tight-fitting leather. A helmet nestled, oh, she was mo on a motorcycle. A helmet, I was like, that's a weird outfit to wear to a work Christmas party. A helmet nestled under one arm while her free hand ran through her tousled hair. Wow. She hadn't spotted them, so Jack raised an arm and waved. Her answering smile lit the room, and Jack felt his stomach tighten painfully. This was unfair. This was definitely not playing by the rules. What this ultimately teaches us is to believe in yourself and your dreams, because in the end, anything is possible.